First of all, very briefly, those IOSH members in the room, if you haven't yet voted for um, council, can you please do so before I think the weekend? I think the closing date is rapidly approaching. I think there's over 50 candidates to choose, I think 13 from. So please don't rush into it and please take your time in, in, in reviewing the candidates. So on to today, there's no more background apart from EWNG. We're trying to have these on a fortnightly basis, these presentations. Um, so please look at your mail, mail shots that come in and please check the LinkedIn page. If you're not a member of the IOCWMG LinkedIn page, please join it and please feed back. If any of you wish to do a presentation for us and for your peers, because we're all peers in this, it's, we're just facilitating it, please join, please um, drop us a line and let me know. The time slot today is roughly one hour. It could be between 35 and 40 minutes or thereabouts to um, to take to, to take um, take questions after that. So on to today's presentation. Igby is a lecturer in health and safety management at the University of Greenwich. He joined in April of last year after completing his PhD study in the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Leeds. His PhD research focused on improving the performance of biofilters for bioaerosols and odour control in waste management facilities. Igby was awarded the Outstanding Junior Scientist Oral Presentation Award for his study by the Aerosol Society UK during the Aero Society Focus Meeting at the University of Bristol in 2017. Of interest, Igby also holds a BSc, his first degree in zoology with a first class honours at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria and as well as the MSc in Environmental Engineering and Project Management with a distinction and best graduating student at the University of Leeds. His MSc dissertation, which is what this presentation focuses on from, uh, focused on assessing the health risk of bioaerosol emissions from materials recovery facilities in the UK and was awarded the 2013 D-Waste Award for Outstanding Performance in Solid Waste Management related dissertation. He holds several health and safety qualifications, but his real skill set is environmental management and he actually is an associate member of the Institute of Environmental Sciences. Igby, it'd be great to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much for joining us today and I hope everyone will enjoy uh, the next 45 minutes. Over to you Igby. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Thank you David. Thank you uh, Dimple and uh, the Environment and Waste Management Group for the invitation. Um, so I'll just be sharing um, experience um, today with um, I'm talking about biosols in waste management facilities. Just share my screen now. Um, all right, I hope you can all see my screen. So my name is Ikbe Ibarra and um, I'll be talking to you today on biosols in waste management facilities. Um, I'll, you know, give a bit brief background on the subject area, and uh, we'll, um, you know, um, share, you know, talk a little bit of the Sniffer projects, uh, which was commissioned by um, Sniffer on behalf of the U UK environmental uh, agencies uh, to, you know, evaluate the performance of uh, uh, facilities, which included biofuels as, uh, as a standalone or in combination as an abatement system, and then, and how that fed into the research, which I'll be sharing with you, you know, at the end and objective, I'll talk, talk through the methods we applied, the results we got, and the conclusions that we had. But before we do that, I just wanna, just to set the pace and get us to have an understanding of the, of where this was done, I have a video to play. So just what is about three, three, four minutes. Thank you. 
facility is currently running at about 160,000 tonnes uh, per annum. Uh, most of that waste is coming from the uh, public sector by way of uh, MSW, black bag waste and residues from city community sites. Uh, we are achieving exceptional, exceptionally high recovery and recycling statistics with very little going to landfill. In fact, the residues are by way of RDF, refuse derived fuel, and we are exporting those materials currently to recovery R1 status uh, CHP plants in uh, Northern Europe. <laughs> and achieve the, our, our ultimate goal of zero to landfill and a significant and high recycling rate as yet not demonstrated in this particular sector. Today's topic, I mean, I, I just need to put that out there so you can watch and begin to have an appreciation of, you know, um, how biosols, uh, when we talk about biosols in waste management, which would, you know, um, would come up later to show you how we did the study. Um, what are biosols? Biosols are aerosols, um, aeroallergens, particulate matter of microbiological plants or animal origin which can interact, you know, um, with living system through infective allergic or toxic mechanism, um, usually range in size uh, for 0 0.1 microns for viruses to 100 plus microns for um, fungal spores. They're aerosolized as clumps, aggregates, or attached to larger um, uh, mineral particles and dust particles. Weather conditions and process parameters can affect their duration and aerosolization. Um, also, by their viability can deteriorate, you know, depending on the prevailing temperature, yeah, humidity, sunlight, and die-off is usually exponential. And another thing is that there, are, there may be uh, non-viable microorganisms may also cause health effects. Um, so why are we interested in biosols? We've seen increase in the number of composting activities. Okay, and, and um, they've received a lot of media attention over, in, over the last, you know, 
a few years over the past few years and uh, the risk of exposure it's a, it's a growing research area um, we have increasing number of complaints you know regarding health effects or the problems we know of this uh, uh, the limbic principle um, in 2009 Alison Seal um, stated that this could be the time bomb of major respiratory health problems in the future the waste and resources action program also said that the issue required more investigation based on study of the uh, on, on impact of fortnightly bean collection so virosols from waste facilities can be you know bacteria fungi which could be viable or non-viable uh, fungal spores could be patho spores which could be pathogenic or non-pathogenic and the toxins and peptidoglycans, which are cell wall components with toxicological properties, mycotoxins, which are secondary metabolites. Occasionally, you may find algal fragments, protozoans, and uh, uh, nematodes, or fragments of nematodes, protozoans, uh, but these are not routinely encountered in um, emissions at waste management facilities. So, what are the potential health effects? Well, Direct studies on health effects is still scarce um, to establish safe levels, dose response relationships. Um, and this is because of the very many species of viable virusols that are in, as I can see in the previous slide, can, you know, can compose of bacteria, fungi, viruses, uh, 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 and, and their cell components. Uh, so many components, there's a whole range of potential health effects that may have other unconnected causes then generally human response is varied and complex so um but generally we would have allergic type reactions systemic toxic effects as well mucous membrane irritation skin uh, irritation chronic bronchitis um, respiratory complaints from people who have been exposed to um, virusols had asthma and for systemic toxic effect, you have chills, flu-like symptoms, excessive tiredness, fever. Uh, and this typify um, invasive aspergillosis, okay? Now, one of the surrogates that we talk about, because it's, it's, it's not possible to look at all the range of microorganisms, you know, um, one of the surrogates that we look at when we talk of viral sources, aspergillus vulgaris, which is a, uh, a, 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 a mold. Okay, it's rapidly growing and survives over a wide range of conditions. It's propagated uh, via airborne spores, two to three millimeters in diameter. They are opportunistic pathogen. Spores can enter the lungs very easily and can be inhaled frequently, but infection is uncommon. Um, there's a wide you know, spectrum of human illnesses, you know, respiratory tract, irritation, colonization of the bronchial tree, you know, and uh, it's of particular concern for immunocompromised individuals. There's people with maybe bone marrow transplant, heart and lung transplant, cystic fibrosis, patients. For healthy humans, the spores are dealt with by the body's in innate immune system. Uh, the upper respiratory tract usually lined with cilia that beat the particles out. And it also has um, tissue macrophages that can engulf them and um, destroy them before they can cause infection. Um, Aphibigatis is also of prime concern in composting and waste management facilities. Okay, they survive over a wide range of temperature, moisture content, you know, um, pH. The optimum conditions are temperatures between 37 and 43 degrees and substrates and survive on substrates with high carbon content. Spores are very small and can, you know, can be carried over long distances. Um, studies have shown that they can be carried as, you know, up to 100 meters on several kilometers downwind from the site where they are generated. So, how and why are biosols generated? Um, raw waste contain high concentrations of microorganisms. Okay, and most um, waste management uh, operations are designed to be dependent on microorganisms. Okay, so uh, uh, and microorganism growth is associated with the breakdown of this organic matter and the increase in their population. And when we have waste operation, okay, it, you know, handling waste, shredding, turning, as we have in composting facilities, storage and movement of waste, 
and uh, you know uh, also dependent on the moisture content of the source material and the prevailing environmental uh, conditions wind rain humidity these sparkles can become aerosolized okay and carried over you know long distances okay the current guidelines uh, is that workers in the vicinity of an activity involving materials uh, material education should be at least um, 30 meters away 250 meter trigger limit has been set by the EA based on uh, Wheeler's studies on dispersal monitoring between 1999 and 2000. Um, this is based on the fact that uh, background concentration, that's concentration, you know, um, background concentration can be reached, you know, within uh, 200 meters. And also that site-specific biosol risk assessment must be carried out if there are sensitive receptors within the uh, within that distance from the site. Sensitive receptors being other properties or buildings that are not part of the composting site or the waste management facility. Now, the EA uh, set acceptable limits at, to be achieved at 250 meters from the composting, from composting facilities, okay, or sensitive receptors. These are limits that should be achieved at 250 meters away from the composting facilities or at sensitive receptors. And, um, and it was based on surrogates, okay? Aphimigatus, total bacteria, and gram-negative bacteria, okay? It's impossible to, or it's difficult to look at the whole range of bioaerosols. So when we talk of measuring biosols, we look at certain in surrogate indicator species, which are the three, and as I've mentioned, uh, so they set acceptable limits to be achieved at these levels to be 500 colony forming units per meter cube of air for aphimigatus, 1,000 colony forming units per meter cube of air for total bacteria, 300 colony forming units for gram negative bacteria. So um, with the uh, landfill, uh, it continues emphasis on diverting waste from land from 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 landfill. Uh, we've had you know, several uh, innovations coming up, in, such as mechanical biological treatment, enclosed windrow systems, uh, in vessel composting and materials recovery facility. Now, while these facilities are delivering on their recycling targets and resource recovery, there is the problem of pollution, air pollution, particularly because of order and viruses within the facility and for you know compromising the air outside when these are exhausted from these facilities now for odor control there have been you know several you know uh, 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 approaches to this one of which is incineration we have um, uh, adsorption using activated carbon uh, we can have activated we can see activated carbon units here suspended you know in the picture here is activated carbon that is suspended from the roof there. We have misting and deodorizers, as we can see from this picture here, and also biofilters, which would form the focus of today's presentation. So biofilters um, have been used with varying degrees of successes in previous studies, okay? Um, what are biofilters? There are basically beds of um, organic media that uh, have that supports the growth of a rich culture of pollutant degrading microorganisms. Okay, so within this bed, we have microorganisms growing, and uh, with the appropriate temperature, uh, moisture content, they support this growth of rich culture, this growth of uh, microbial population. Now, Polluted air from waste management facilities, as we've seen in the previous slide, is fed through the bar filter. And in passing through the filter bed, they are being uh, degraded. So the pollutant diffuse into the bar fume layer within the bar filter media, and they become degraded and CO2 water vapor is released and the air is treated. So that was the principle for bio, for odor control. Now, the EA expects that all abatement systems, you know, should be able, including those using biofilters, should be able to control for all emissions, including bioaerosols. 
Now, the big question is, how do you use a system that depends and uses microorganisms, that is dependent on microorganisms for odor degradation, to also control for microorganisms, viruses coming in in the process air? Okay, so um, the EA had launched uh, commissioned a, a, a sniffer project on behalf of the uh, environment agencies of the UK, the the, agent, uh, uh, um, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. Uh, it was carried out by a team from the University of Leeds and Odonet to try and understand biofilter performance and determining emission concentrations under operational conditions. So what they did was they basically looked at um, eight um, facilities in vessel composting facilities and closed um, uh, waste treatment facilities that use biofilters either as standalone or in combination with scrubbers to say how are they performing under varying conditions. What conditions, what design and operating parameters are necessary to achieve simultaneous control of viruses and order, okay? How were they performing, okay? And their findings was that order control, biofilters were able to achieve up to 94% removal with outlet concentrations of 200 to 5,000 5, order units per meter cube of air. But for biorosols, the performance was variable with time and size. And the removal mechanism may not be the same for order and biorosol. So for order is by absorption and degradation by microorganism, uh, by the microbial population within the bed. But for biorosols, they suggested that it was removed by impaction, you know, on the biofilter media within the bed. Okay? So, they recommended that it was necessary to carry out a study to determine the criticality of design and operating parameters on biofilter performance, okay? So that formed the basis of my study, which then looked at biofilter performance assessment for bioresource control. For this particular presentation, I'll just be focusing on the aspects of the study which looked at bioresource, and we'll be looking at the, uh, the biofilter evaluation for removal efficiency of biorosols and evaluation of the net biorosols emitting potential. Now, that second objective stems from the fact that uh, it was suspected that biofilters may be adding to the outlet population, okay? That the proportion of the, the, the outlet concentration may actually be originating from within the filter bed and not from the process air that is being treated, okay? And also to have a fuller picture on the performance, we were also interested in seeing the impact of bile filtration on biosource particle size distribution between the inlet and outlet samples, okay? So what did we do? So we selected the site to be a material recovery facility based on a previous study which was done and uh, at the res this is results from the previous study which was done in 2003 to um, assess the concentrations that we had on those areas days to uh, within the waste hall. So we saw that the waste hall um, had potentially high um, um, concentrations of mesophilic bacteria and Aspergillus fumigatus uh, on any day. And we had concentrations ranging from 10 to 3 to 10 to 5, you know, colony forming units per meter cube of air, and that was necessary for our purpose. To give us a more appreciation, that's what it looks like, okay? So that's the waste, um, that's the waste, uh, waste hall, reception hall. So uh, the trucks come in here and empty their waste as we had seen from the, 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 the video that I earlier showed. And here we have over two kilometers of conveyor belts which carry waste from one point to the other. We have a dinosaurus machine there you know, um, feeding the hopper here that feeds the conveyor belt. So all of this activity, you know, causes aerosolization of dust, aerosolization of, you know, uh, this microbial population, okay? So um, for, for, for the biofilter construction, 
And it was made up of four reactors. We used Willy Beans to construct it, and it was modeled after the study of Chen and Hoff in 2012, um, so which had you know, four reactors with a central plenum. So basically the air was, you know, we used a fan to draw the air into the central plenum, which ensured the air mixed here, and then fed each of the four bow filters. The media that we used was um, the wood chip, wood chip which was easily sourced and available and we use, use wood chip because it had its own um, inherent uh, content of nutrients so we didn't need to supply nutrients and it also had microbial population by the time we launched uh, commissioned it on the site for you know um, for, for the study we allowed it to stabilize and build a rich culture of microorganisms for about one month before sampling started so that's um that's with the uh, biofilter construction. Now, that's the summary of the, the operating parameters of the biofilter, but we were particularly interested in this, you know, in this form. All of these were within the ranges suggested in literature and in the SNIFA project, okay? We looked at uh, media, media type, of course, wood chip, porosity of 61% greatly. Uh, moisture content was within 40 to 70%, media height was 0.5. And of course, we tested various uh, gas residence time. Now, we took the biofilters on site. We located it behind the back push wall so that we can situate it as close as possible to the source of the polluted air, okay? All of those activity generated air that was um, very foul smelling and um, had high um, concentrations of microorganism. And of course, that's where it is. I'm going to give you a closer shot. At, so that's where we located the bow filter. Uh, I didn't want to, I would have loved it for it to be somewhere here, but no, I uh, had to also be concerned for my health and safety. So uh, I, um, that's behind the back push wall where we had the, the rig set up. For microbial quantification and detection, we followed the M9 protocol. Um, it was the A4 protocol, but now the M9 protocol. And we use the six-stage Anderson sampler instead of the single-stage Anderson sampler, which um, gave us two things, basically, giving us total uh, the concentration and the size distribution, which was necessary to simulate the long deposition of these particles. So, um, that's what, what, what the sampler does. So basically, uh, particle size, you know, larger than seven microns will be deposited in the nasopharyngeal region. Um, particle size between three to seven microns would be deposited in the trachea and the uh, bronchi and bronchioles. And these areas, the upper respiratory tracts, have the capacity to expel deposited particles. The particle size less than three microns, which is actually uh, the one of health concern would penetrate deep down into the alveoli. So the principle within the, the, um, the, 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 the sampler is that tiny particles tend to remain in the S stream and will be deposited in the last, you know, the lower uh, two play, uh, stages of the sampler, whereas more larger particles will be deposited in the upper, upper uh, stages of the sampler thus simulating the long deposition of these particles. Right, so we, you know, covered the range of surrogate species that we covered in the SNIFA project. Um, we looked at Aspergillus migatus, total mesophilic bacteria, gram-negative bacteria. Um, and of course, remember, the E had set the limits, 500 coliforming units per meter cube of uh, air for Aspergillus migatus, 1,000 for total mesophilic bacteria, and 300 for gram-negative bacteria. So that is a summary of the concentration of the process air before we treated it, okay? And it shows you, this is for the study, the last you know, row there is for this study, and it shows you how it compares to uh, the previous study by Fletcher, by Fredrickson, by Kuma and Thiel and Fisher and, and Sanchez and Monedero. You can see that it compares quite well between 10 to three and 10 to five colony forming units, of, of uh, uh, per, per meter cube of air, okay? So, what did we find out? Now, in terms of um, uh, Aspergillus migatus and total fungi concentration, 
we found that the average removal efficiency for spirulina fumigant was 70, and total fungi was about 71, you know, uh, percent. That's the range there, okay? And similar for, the, for, for, the, for bacteria, the removal efficiency was slightly, you know, reduced at 68 percent for total mesophilic bacteria and 50 percent for gram-negative bacteria. Now, what we drew from this was that biofilters designed to treat order can also achieve, you know, uh, biosol removal, okay? Now, another key thing here that we've seen from uh, these two results is that uh, the outlet concentration, yes, we are achieving 70% removal for, 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 the fungal, for, for the fungi and 68% for the bacteria. Even though these high removal efficiencies are achieved, the outlet concentration was still higher than the limits set by the EA. Okay, but in full scale application, of course, when we have that installed in full scale, would have um, uh, the impact of wind dilution, and of course, they'll be exposed to other environmental stressors, temperature, oxygen, open air factors, which would may further play part in you know the die off. Okay, now recall that I had said that we were also interested in the net biosols emitting potential of biofilters. The fact that we're using a system that depends on microorganisms to control microorganisms, we were concerned, is our biofilters adding to the population coming out? So we relocated the biofilter setup to, to, uh, to an external bay that had been out of operation for about 11 months, okay? And the essence was to feed it with air that was, you know, that had really low concentrations of micro, of, uh, 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 of, of biosols, okay? And what did we see? The removal efficiency is deteriorated. Here for Aspiglitz Migatus, we had it deteriorate to as low as minus 83. And that means that the biofilter outlet concentration, the biofilter was adding to the biofilter, the, the outlet concentrations uh, that, we, that we had. The same thing was seen for the mesophilic bacteria, okay? Uh, concentrations dropping to minus 122 and minus 128 and one, minus 125 uh, percent there, implying that the biofilter was adding to the, so if a proportion of the outlet concentration was uh, actually coming out from the biofilter there, okay? So for us, what did that tell us? It means that the biofilter, there's a potential, maybe adding to the outlet concentration, okay? Now we plotted, um, we did a linear, reg a linear regression um, of biosols removal efficiency and log 10 of biosols inlet concentration. And we found that, that the result was statistically significant for bacteria and uh, for bacteria. And what this tells us that was that we were much more confident in how the system and there may be differences between the way the system deals with bacteria and for fungi, okay? And also the low, at low inlet concentrations, you know, removal, removal efficiencies deteriorate, further confirming um, the earlier point made that the biofilter may be added, adding their own, you know, population, resident population to the outlet concentration. And that the diff also the differences between bacteria and fungi performance here on this graph may also be size related, okay? Okay, for that confirming why we had the reduced uh, removal efficiency for bacteria as, a, as we compared it to the fungi, okay? We had the bacteria going at about 68% um, for the mesophilic bacteria and 50% for gram-negative bacteria, whereas for the fungi we had up to 70% removal. So one of the things that we thought about here that was responsible for that difference was the differences in size in, you know, of these particles, okay? Another thing that we were interested in was the impact of biofiltration on uh, the particle size distribution. We can see here, we've put in values there for the bacteria, for, for the background, the inlet, and the four outlets. And the inlet, all the outlets 
had um, significantly higher uh, proportion of particle size, three microns and below, okay? So these are the size range that would deposit, you know, in the, deep in, in, into the long uh, alveoli, whereas this size range would be deposited in the upper respiratory tract, okay? And uh, another thing we found was that, okay, the inlet concentration had uh, lower concentrations of this size range that would present, represent um, health concerns, and when compared to the outlet, uh, outlet samples. But don't forget, this outlet samples is already reduced, okay? Um, don't forget the 70% removal efficiency um, for fungi and the 68 and 50% for total mesophilic bacteria and gram-negative bacteria respectively, okay? So to give us a more clearer picture, that's it represented there. So we have for Aphibigatus, about 35% of the outlet concentration were of the size less than 3.3 microns, okay? And those are, it's been color coded there, that the one that would deposit deep in the alveoli, where it would present a more, you know, uh, health concern. But when you compare that to the outlet concentration, we had there about 70% of the size of the particles were, of the size that would go down into the alveoli for all outlets. Similarly for the bacteria, we had about 45% of the particle sizes to be in the range uh, that would get in deep into the alveoli and then about 65% in for all the, um, uh, the outlets. So our conclusions therefore was that um, Biofilter's design to treat order can also achieve removal efficiencies up to 97 for Ephemingatis, 94 for total fungi, 86% for total mesophilic bacteria, and 85 for gram negative bacteria. Um, and this means that it can, it, 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 it may have the potential to, to control for pathogenic species where these are given off within uh, or from the process and waste management facilities. Also, differences may exist between fungi and bacteria removal by biofilters, which we may, there was more confidence with the performance for bacteria than fungi. And these may be size related, with the fungi being the larger particles better removed. Um, okay, and the inlet concentration is also important for bacteria, okay? Um, biofilters may be net emitters of bio, bio aerosols at low inlet concentrations. And of course, we established that there was particle size variations between inlet and outlet, with the outlet having more, a higher proportion of the size range that would be, or that would represent um, health concerns. But in full scale applications, we would have these coming up, you know, and would be subjected to various environmental stressors which may further, and wind dilution, which may further impact on their um, reduction. So, um, provided some references there, and um, I want to acknowledge um, AWM that provided this facility, their facility for uh, this study, and the University of Leeds for funding this, um, this project. And of course, my supervisors, uh, Dr. Louis Fletcher and Professor Catherine Noakes of the Institute for Public Health and environmental engineering. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Um, many thanks indeed. A lot covered in there, a lot of information, and there are a few questions that have, have come in. Okay. But I will take those as they are. If anyone else has a question, please send them. Um, somebody asked a question earlier on whether there was an interesting question is can the bioaerosols reach the bloodstream. These are, my understanding is these are respiratory. Yes. Therefore, these they are. wouldn't, therefore, necessarily would actually go into the bloodstream. Yeah, there are, these are, I mean, these are respiratory because um, they'll be inhaled. Um, it is not uncommon to, uh, to have, I mean, uh, while on site, I've seen people, you know, people are talking, people are touching. 
uh, you know, they have, they, are, they, are, they are phases, may actually ingest them. So we have different routes for um, in, infection or how they can gain access. Ingestion, um, they can go in through, you know, open surfaces, um, and then they can be inhaled. So um, whether or not, it, they're, they're mi microorganisms, they, once they gain access into the body, yeah, they can they can find their way into a second. I had shown the um, systemic uh, type reaction, uh, which can actually invade the body. Yeah. Okay. So there are some another questions come in by a gentleman called John Paul, and I won't mention surname to people, but um, the question is: Is coronavirus a bioaerosol? Wow! And that's totally <laughs> off. That's totally off the cuff. <laughs> From the chat I showed, viruses are viruses, okay? So we have viruses as viruses. Yeah, so I would say, and of course, what, what, what it, it's, it, it just means aerosols that are, uh, that are airborne. And uh, the reason we have people wearing face masks is to make sure that, you know, we don't spread them when we talk and when we, uh, when we talk and when we breathe. So yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Gentleman by the first name of Russell has asked the question, is the EA monitoring protocol for bioaerosols is proving very difficult to implement? That is the M9EA guidance, owing to difficulties of access around our facilities. Have you any thoughts on in terms of access to get sampling? I take it to get sampling done is the problem. Any thoughts on that? Or are we, are we back to the usual question of once you retrospectively fit something, you get a problem. This is why good planning in advance is vital. Yeah. So I, I didn't quite get the question, David. Well, it was a statement was made. I'm trying to make a question out of a statement here. The EA monitoring protocol for bioaerosols, that's yeah. N9, is proving very difficult to implement owing to difficulties of access around our facilities. Really, if any comments or thoughts you've got on that you want to take or make. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I quite understand. Um, the sample I use are actually static samplers, and one of the one of the approach that we use are, you know, just to have an idea on, you know, what uh, the concentrations of aerosols that people are faced with are the body uh, uh, monitors, so that are, you know you can clip on the. Um, I think this uh, was recommended for some study that we did in a landfill um, open dump site in Nigeria where we had. Um, personal samplers clipped on the person of waste pickers in, on, on, on that site and which showed really good results. So um, there are, I mean, I, I quite understand um, the difficulty with that, but um, with these and citing it close to uh, whatever area of, of the facility that you're interested in, yeah, you can get some results that can at least help you give you a baseline, you know, uh, overview of, of, of the concentrations you may be dealing with. Okay. Next question I've got is what type of woods were used in the filters or what type of wood was used in the filters? Um, the, the wood chip was made of, um, I think, mostly um, oak and we had um, um, source from Garforth which proved quite, you know, Garforth logs, um, this was in Leeds, uh, was made of oak. Um, we also, of course, this wasn't covered as part of this study, was that we looked at the impacts of media types. So we looked with wood chips, we use wheat straw, we use pits to also see how they performed as alternative media. So yeah, uh, it was, um, they, they had oak, they, I'm not sure they had teak in there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next one, do you think there are better technologies out there to kill bacteria, i.e. chemical scrubbing? Yeah, there are. There are. Um, of course, uh, chemical scrubbing, uh, we had scrubbers. Uh, some, some, some of those sites that were involved in the Sniffer project had chemical scrubbers. Um, um, that that you know that that we used um, activated uh, carbon as well can you know trapped uh, but for one of the facilities we found out that more 
uh, we, you know, these are facilities that were put in to treat order, don't forget. But in treating order, they also trap particles. And on one of those cases, they may perform well for bacteria and may not so well for odor. In fact, in one of the sites, we saw that more odor was recorded at the outlet than at the inlet. So, yeah. Okay, a question where I, uh, technically I have to pass on this myself. Gentlemen, I think it is uh, Yazir. What are the key advantages and disadvantages of this treatment technology comparing with waste converter technology? We, waste con converter technology. Um, do, we need, do, we need, do we need more information to answer the question? I think we need more information to that. But advantages of biofilters has been low cost. Um, they're environmentally friendly. They don't generate uh, secondary pollutants that would need special dis disposal. Mm -hmm. um, um, they can treat you know high volume of of, of waste uh, processed air and they can treat a wide spectrum of of, of pollutants um, so yeah those are the key advantages of biofilters over other technologies that are there in the in the market okay and then someone by uh, some by the first name of olympia in relation to occupational monitoring for staff in waste facilities what is industry best practice to do and legal requirement in UK question mark thank you I'm going to throw in Kosh yeah that's the first Kosh. thing yeah uh, in fact in my thesis I had you know reference Kosh that that's uh, you know the, that that risk assessment covers that um, it's it's really one of the key things and this was also supported by other speakers in some of the conference that I attended Waste workers sometimes think they are superhumans. I don't know, people, you know, not using, not going by, you know, what has the guideline that has been provided. You find people, you know, not behaving correctly, um, not using the right, uh, you know, maybe respirators within. Um, you know, there's this, um, you know, I had documented my findings and I provided and then that helped in monitoring and surveilling. Uh, so, yeah. So in terms of legal requirement, we don't have things like as in EH40, as in levels, because the, the technology and knowledge is still becoming increasing. Yeah. So um, I think and that links to another question again, but a, a comment this time by Russell, a statement. He says the HSE are taking increasing interest in health effects within the waste industry. Okay. It may be the future that we will have to use on-site monitoring for exposure to workers as illustrated in the presentation. And, and I will say, yes, that's, that is true. Monitoring will actually increase the knowledge is involved in that. And I know that if people want to, I know Igby at Greenwich, when we were talking, when I was working there, you, but anyone that wants to do some research in that area to, to gain more knowledge, yeah. drop Igby a line, his email is there. Um, there are papers we, we could get out with more information. Yeah. I think the big challenge is that the, the standard five steps to risk assessment that people use doesn't tend to work very well regarding health effects because the people very often doing the risk assessment don't understand the health effects of what they've got around them and many of them don't have to have an understanding of human uh, physiology and how the yeah. body actually works yeah so I, I have some and I'm saying it's a challenge here because in my days working in local authorities of my own PhD I saw risk assessments for health effects very very weak people were just focusing on traditional safety and how that was being interpreted in local authority reports to sell yeah. the councils for systems was extremely worrying. I don't want to go any further than that to say that because people might get uncomfortable with that. <laughs> um, Clement, a question, have there been any research done on the lifetime of biofilters and what are the challenges to maintain its efficiency? Um, the, the SNIFA project just went in, was a study that you know, just looked at how uh, existing systems performed. And, it, you know, it was just for a short period. Um, currently, I'm still communicating with the team at Leeds to actually look at full scale with the result that we've had from the PhD. Um, full scale application in a life facility within Leeds to, and then monitor it over three, four, five years to see 
how it took. That is still, um, that is still um, um, there. But one of the sites that was in, involved in, that was included in the Sniffer project, um, actually used wheelie bins. I mean, uh, roll on, roll off skips is uh, rather. And um, they performed very well. It allowed for turning. Um, I think every, every month they turn, you know, turn to ensure that um, appropriate levels of moisture was, um, was, was, was maintained and uh, was maintained and uh, the, the population of uh, uh, because what what tends to happen is is that in some micro in some field biofilters you have um um odor coming out you know there may be uh sections that are not well um aerated sections that are you know you have blind spots that have water that you know then generates odor so um those kind of maintenance regimes are there uh, of course, ensuring that the water is, uh, water content is within the range, 40 to 70 degrees, uh, 70 percent. So that that would be appropriate for maintaining a high um, um, performance of the biofilters. Yeah. I mean, a gentleman called Chris has asked a question. I think it's, what would you expect to be done to manage, for, in, for instance, the jet washing of wheelie binge back at the depot, and? And I asked the question, did the council have a cleaning process of bins? And they said, yes, just this is a closer by aerosols guidance to be compliant and protect staff. Something that I know was said by, I think it was Dr. Tony Gladding, and I'm pleased if I, if I misquote, I do apologise, that um, the worry with by aerosols is people that exist in medical conditions, as we said, people with asthma and things such as that. So when you're recruiting and going through health surveillance, what questions are asked when people actually go on the job? Because I think the only the only jobs I think are where, where I'm familiar with having done this is like the road haulage industry where people have to be fit to drive a vehicle and they require a doctor's uh, note. But again, it does raise the bar about how healthy are people and how you're maintaining that health surveillance uh, yeah. throughout. Yeah. And and I think when I looked at that question about jet washing of wheelie bins, is actually how is the water being recirculated if it is being? Are people re when they're pe cleaning the cleaning the water etc. They're recycling it. Are they going through Legionella treatments such as that as well? I saw a very interesting one being um, very interesting wheel system, a, a washing system being built up in, I think it was in, in, in uh, Banbury, which is Chilwell yeah. Council a number of uh, years ago. So we've got some, so yes, have you any thoughts on jet washing of wheelie bins back at the Bet Depot? I mean, that, that would be something, uh, not at the moment, but uh, that would be something that would be interesting to look at. Um, jet washing of wheelie bins, no, that would be something that would be, interesting to to look at but you know when you use jet as, as as you know there would be of course um, um uh, uh, the particle breakup and uh, which can you know have all micro uh, by uh, aerosols pick up aerosols from the the bin a study again from tony gladding which you just um, uh, mentioned i think looked at delayed pickup of wheelie beans and showed that you know, when we have delayed pickup of beans, uh, it would lead to buildup of um, high, you know, uh, populations of microorganisms, which would then be aerosolized when they are being picked. So um, um, that can be another opportunity where um, um, we can have aerosolization. Yeah, so that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Another question by Michael. If a biofilter was left in situ for an excessive period, would it reach a capacity of what it could handle and then pump high concentrating bio air into the facility? What we found is over time, because these are organic, the, the wood chip is organic. Um, what, of course, there are other alternatives which are inorganic, um, support media for the microorganisms. Because they are organic, the microorganisms would break them, would break down this media bed over time and they become compacted okay that reduces uh, the, the the void the porosity and uh, that can cause a problem that can cause a problem in terms of maintenance so the uh, the the energy you need to force the air through okay there will be increased cost there so um yeah, that that can present a, a, a problem over time but um wood chips have been seen to you know last for up to five years a, a, a comment a comment from another IRCWMG member, Ian, it's not just wheelie bin washing at the depot. There are suppliers that provide this offering at residential, other commercial 
property. Yeah, the people that go around the street, how they maintain clean water and everything when they've done 200 bins around people's houses. I, I tend to worry about that. That's an observation from me. <laughs> um, a question from Chris. Has the waste facility reported any ill health, Ill health cases with just those base levels of bioaerosols in the processing area? No. No, that was something that we were actually interested. Has anyone gone ill? So um, they tend to be very, uh, but then this calls for a need to maybe monitor the, that, that particular group of workers over time to see what they actually come down with years later. But as at the time of the study, um, you know, we asked Beverly, um, conversation with the operators, um, we didn't have, you know, um, ill health that were, you know, that we could attribute to exposure to biorosols. But that doesn't mean that, uh, uh, of course, we've seen from what I've, uh, the, 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 the likely ill health that associated with um, biorosols exposure that I showed in earlier slides. Another question now from a name that might be familiar, Lamin. What are the what are some of the disadvantages of using biofilters? Disadvantages. Yeah. Um, I kind of actually, um, it just that we would have. Um, I hadn't actually thought about that because I was actually looking at why we would be selling this why would be would we have this obviously because of the the fact that we we the, the, the advantages with i had mentioned the low cost the ease of sourcing media materials uh, but in terms of uh, disadvantage maybe um the, the maintenance that you require okay the maintenance that is required you need people to be there to actually um, what I simulated in this study was just, uh, it showed the extreme of a good and well-maintained biofilter, okay? So it, I had to be there, I had to be there because I knew that I needed to make sure that, but are these actually maintained in real life, in full-scale application? The maintenance regime that I had put in place, would it be achievable? So um, it would need um, a lot of attention. So I would say, yeah, the maintenance is required. To make it work okay a giant from Oman so we are we are global here so I'll ask no more questions coming because we've got about four minutes a minute left so we'll take the five questions I've got here is it possible to use this bioaerosol filter for landfill purposes or are there any other systems available for landfill application these are these are these are for enclosed waste management um, facilities. So where you can actually extract the air, that wouldn't be possible for landfills, which are, you know, open. Um, I, I haven't seen the application of this for landfill um, purposes. I, I, yeah, yeah I, I think if we go back to last week's lecture, which was, uh, or two weeks ago, which was um, Stuart from Cranfield, that the, the challenge is things like landfill mining where you'll find that materials don't decompose in the ground and if you are yep. reopening a closed tips i suspect there may be issues of bioaerosols the thing is that we don't actually have the tech have the knowledge about what's in there because we haven't actually started developing it so there are challenges as we try to minimize this uh, we try to sort of improve the circular economy try to make the circular economy with stuff already we've chucked away bring that back yeah. into the economy i think these are the challenges going going yeah. forward yeah. um so i'll close that one out so do you matthew do you feel that the ea place do you feel that the ea place enough of an emphasis on bioaerosols and their impact on the waste management industry so i think for the ea point of view is how are they doing it from the non-health and safety enforcement point of view yeah, I mean, of course, this is um, this this. Uh, they were quite in the EA was quite interested in this in this research because um, um, because of pe uh, pe uh, the permits grant granting uh, permits. Um, uh, the the SNIFA project, which which I mentioned earlier, um, wasn't quite conclusive, and there more and more studies are required to give them. Um, uh, evidence to make a robust, you know, in, in a more informed decisions with permit granting. 
So um, it's 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 important, and of course, with all the um, increased uh, complaints and health that you know uh, we've they've received, uh, this is becoming more and more important. You know, important for them. Yeah. Another question from Shiraz. How do we first identify the presence of uh, bioaerosols? Well, from <laughs> that's got to, that's got to, that's got to be. A, a, I would suggest that's got to be a mixture of risk assessment yeah. on, on, based upon the feed that's coming into your facility or what you're collecting. You need to know what you're doing. To yeah. identify, have you have you got? If you're just recycling. Uh, tin cans or just yeah. clean tin cans or plastics. I don't suspect you'll get bio aerosols. Yeah, I suspect if you have got composting or food waste, I think they're the two key areas. I think for most people in most countries. So I think it is just do your waste data flow of what material you've got and what's coming out. Exactly. So okay, you know, we, could, we could get pedantic and say, well, how about dirty cans that have got food residue inside them? In which case, I think we're going down a bit. Yeah. Too far. Then I don't think we're quite there yet for that. But I think I'd say that risk assessment, if I dare make that contribution. Yeah, that's, that's the spot on that, David. So risk assessment, of course, would show you what what material you're dealing with and um, and how they'll be degraded. The waste materials that would be they would always they would carry um, a high population um, of 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 microorganisms, which with agitation and and handling would cause aerosolization. So that's in the in the first, and of course, with the risk assessment, you'll be able to put in um, things in place to make sure that that is um, controlled for. Another contribution from Russell. Appreciate all your contributions from everyone, by the way. The EA have stated in our permit that the biofilter must be fifty percent efficient. We have to we have to have the system kept biannually. Can you type in where you are, Russell? Actually, which if your local authority or um, exactly or what exactly you are, because be nice to know geographically. Um, what part of the country you're in, if, you, if you're able to do that. Um, another question I had here. That, ah, okay. Wolverhampton. Thank you very much, Russell. Um, another question I had in, I'm just seeing through, because someone put a question in um, here. What are the instruments used to measure residual bioaerosols in a contaminated environment and what other techniques? I think, I think we covered all that, did we not? Yeah, we, we covered that. We... I mean, we use there's there, there are I, I, for this study I use the six stage Anderson sampler. Um, uh, there are impingers which you, we you can use as well. Um, there are you know personal uh, mo uh, monitors that you can use. Um, um, that you know single stage sampler. There are you know uh, so the impaction and impingement. Yeah, there are there are techniques over there. Right, that is all the Q and A's taken. It's just gone two o'clock. It, it's been fantastic hearing you. Some of the appre notes of appreciation and thanks in the webinar chat are great. And I hope you've enjoyed presenting and I hope people, if people want to talk to Igby further, um, either contact me or contact him and we, we, we know each other pretty well. Yeah. Um, we can always touch base together. All right. So this is the unsocial bit where we say thank you very much for everyone. Please uh, thank you for filling in the questionnaire, those of you who've done it. Thank and you. we hope to see you in two weeks' time when we're talking about something on more about urban sustainability and transport. So, that again, there'll be something coming up um, through a link through the appropriate IOSH forums. And please, everyone, please share the invitations. These are not close to IOSH members. Anyone can join in. So if you've got a sustainability manager, an HR manager, a business continuity manager, they're all invited to come and listen to these, um, these webinars. Two more Q&As have quickly come in. To thanks very much indeed. Thanks for the thanks, guys. This is the unsocial bit where I say, cheerio, have a good time. I then cut you all off. So I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thanks again, Nick B. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.